everyone and welcome to Church Online. Now remember, straight after Church Online today, we can meet together on Zoom. That's 11 a.m. using the details that are right here on screen now. But next Sunday, we're not online. But next Sunday, we are not on Zoom. Next Sunday, on the 9th of May, 11.15, we're meeting here on our car park at Brindley House. And if the weather is kind to us like it was on Easter Sunday morning, uh, then we'll be outside. And if the weather's not quite so good, then we'll be staying in our cars and it'll be our first ever proper driving church service. Now, you do need to book in online, so please go to our website to do that today. Let us know that you're coming. Uh, and then we can arrange the car park plan well in advance. Now here, or at least inside here last Wednesday, at our Strengthen Prayer and Worship Evening, Dave introduced a new song to us called Another in the Fire. Now this song, it speaks of how Jesus is with us in every fire, in every difficult time that we might go through. It reassures us that he stands next to us. So church, let's worship together this morning with this song.
Hi everyone, last week we started a new series looking at this idea of what it is to live up to our call to be a radiant church and of course navigating our way forward through this global pandemic as well. And I encourage you actually, if you missed last week, to go catch up on that. You can do that on YouTube. And really, the main headers from last week are that as the church, the people of God, we are called to radiate Christ. We are called to shine in the darkest times. Like Peter says, you know, we're called to be a holy people who are called to be countercultural, set apart, God's special possession. And this is a main theme also for the Apostle Paul in his letters. And in week one, we said, we become what we behold. And this was looking particularly at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 18, with this idea that as we look to Jesus, as we contemplate on his glory, as we worship him, we are changed into his likeness. But then, of course, we look at the tension there and how sometimes we can make false idols of God. Maybe we behold this God as a Santa Claus God. Maybe we behold this God as a distant God. But actually, we are called to look at this God through the cross. And as we look at the cross, we imitate Jesus. We look to Jesus. We behold Jesus. And in beholding Jesus, we are changed to be more like him. You know, it's my prayer and certainly the challenge for this series that we radiate in such a way that the world stops and takes notice and says, hang on a minute, you know, that they look at the church and they say, is that what God looks like? So let's remember that in week one, we said we need to behold a vision of Jesus to be transformed. Now this week, I want to look at a second vision that we need to behold. And it's Jesus' vision of the kingdom of God and what it is to be kingdom people, in fact. And throughout scripture, Jesus paints a picture, a vision of his kingdom. And then in Matthew's gospel, chapter 13, verses 44 to 46, Jesus says this about his kingdom. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Now, I wonder if there's ever been anything in your life that you have wanted so much that you have sold everything you own for. And as a child, if I wanted something new, the latest gadget or toy that was expensive, uh, my mum would make us sell some of our old toys that we already owned, maybe didn't play with anymore, in order to buy this new thing that was of great value. And um, back in the day, we didn't have Facebook Marketplace or eBay, so we would place an advert on the buy and sell page in the local newspaper, the Express and Star. And um, and then it got really super exciting because that would be printed in black and white in this newspaper and then a random stranger would see that ad and they would call us on our landline and, um, and they would turn up at the house, you know, and they would buy these toys from us at the door. And I don't ever remember selling absolutely everything I had in order to get one single toy, one new thing. I don't think, I think that would have been a sacrifice too much. But Jesus, when he paints this picture of the kingdom, it is so valuable. He paints this picture of something that is so good and so worth it. And maybe sometimes when we think of the kingdom of God and what it is to be a radiant people of God, you know, a new way of living and being, you know, showing his love, people who lean into this countercultural way of the kingdom in such a way that the world looks upon us and notices. And maybe when we think, you know, on this, we can think it sounds a little bit utopian and a little bit out of reach, maybe a little bit too expensive. And sometimes as a result of this, sometimes we can immediately just step back. We can feel overwhelmed by what it means and maybe we can say it looks impossible, like, yeah, right, as if we could do that. We are just broken individuals, right? We are just trying to figure out what it means to be the people of God. And when it feels like that, we can reduce the Christian life. We sell ourselves short and we settle. 
You know, we think I'm just a broken sinner saved by grace. And of course, there's truth in that. So, but then we go on to just manage our life, manage the sin in our life. Maybe we could just live a good-ish life and then maybe one day we will get to heaven. And so we just do enough. But in doing this, we sell ourselves short. And also as well, we can live from a place of emptiness and exhaustion, where we just do the bare minimum. We just go to church to get filled, maybe on Sundays and also midweek, and we settled. Maybe it's just okay, we say, to just have this mediocre character or terrible at times character, but where we say, I'm okay, as long as I don't hurt anyone, it's fine. But I've got to say, there is more than this. You know, we were made for more than this. And um, Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. And Jesus said, you know, that same spirit that fell at Pentecost, that same spirit, I have given that to you. And that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, you know, that is yours. And yet, do we just shrug our shoulders and settle? And in settling, when we hear the commands of Jesus, like love your neighbor as yourself, do we say, did he really just mean to an extent until you become uncomfortable? Or when Jesus said, pray for those who persecute you, did he only mean a certain type of persecution? Or when Jesus said, carry your cross, did he mean only if it's towards your vision of success? And when he said, keep my commandments, did he just mean when it's easy? And when he said, love God with everything, did he really only mean give him the bare minimum? You know, what's comfortable, what's easy? And when Jesus said, forgive those who have offended you, did he really say just when it's necessary? Otherwise, actually just forget it. When Jesus said, deny yourself, did he really mean, still make it all about you? And when he said, be perfect because your father in heaven is perfect, did he really mean, oh, don't worry about the definition of perfect, let's just tone that back a bit. You see, I don't think Jesus would give us an unattainable vision. When he sets out commands, surely he thought it was attainable. You know, many have wrestled with the way and the commands of Jesus. And in Matthew 5, 6 and 7, we see the Sermon on the Mount there, you know, where Jesus gives some difficult commands on his vision for the Christian life, for the kingdom. And some people might say to me, you know, Lisa, so what's your vision for our church? You know, what's your vision for living hope going forward? And it's so easy to set out my vision or our vision, but I think we should look back at Jesus's original vision before we set any, any ideas that we have. Because it's here that we see Jesus's heart, we see Jesus's passion, we see Jesus's vision of what the people of God can be. But Jesus really believed this is how the people of God could live, by the power of the Holy Spirit working in them. You know, he talks about the poor in spirit being blessed and happy, and he talks about relationships, he talks about divorce, and he talks about a kingdom where we live under Jesus' reign, rule, and authority, where we get to live a life that is blessed, blessed with God and blessed with one another. Now, to be clear, of course, we wait for the fullness of the kingdom to come. And as the people of Christ, we already live in the now, but the not yet kingdom, a present yet future kingdom. And that future we look towards where there will be no more sorrow and no more tears and a new heaven and new earth of a resurrected people, a place of shalom, you know, and it's those future promises of the kingdom that set the tone for the here and the now that should inform the present. And so we don't look to the future and think, oh, well, why bother? You know, that is simply unattainable. Instead, we relentlessly set our sights on that vision and that vision which Jesus paints for us in the Sermon on the Mount, a present and future vision of what it is like to be the people of God. You know, Jesus gives us this vision of kingdom life throughout scripture. And as we dig into scripture, we discover that there were people who encountered, who tasted, who experienced the kingdom, who knew the kingdom actually was being ushered 
in. So when the disciples tasted, experienced the kingdom, what did they do? You know what they did? And I suggest we do this too. They set their vision on the kingdom. And what vision do you and I reorient our lives around? Jesus gives the disciples pictures to help them. In Matthew 13, he talks about what it is like because this was a mysterious concept to them. He tells the story of a couple of individuals um, who came across this fine prize, this pearl. And when they discover it, we see what seems to be a reckless decision actually to sell everything that they had to acquire this pearl. Nowadays, we'd say, don't sell everything that you have for a treasure or a pearl, you know. That's like saying, don't put all your eggs in one basket. That would be foolish. But we see a seemingly reckless decision to reorder and reprioritize one's life to acquire that treasure. This is what the kingdom life looks like, where people come under the rule and reign of Jesus. You know, it's far from managing our lives in a good way or going to church once or twice a week. It wasn't about having your Sunday or your and then your Christian life um, separate to your work life. You know, it's not a life living in emptiness or a life of half heartedness. It's not a just get by life. To those looking on who don't understand it, seemingly a reckless life in pursuit of the kingdom. So what they did is they reorient their entire lives towards that vision. They didn't look at it and shrug their shoulders, their shoulders um, and say, you know, that is not attainable. They reoriented their entire lives towards it. And if I'd asked you at the start of this morning, who wants to live this radiant life? I think most of us watching would say, yes, of course. So what is it then that might cause us to settle for a halfway in our Christian life? What is it that prevents us from reordering our lives around the kingdom? You see, these people, they, they reprioritized their lives towards that vision. As they reordered, they reprioritized what was important. And as we come out of lockdown restrictions, it is gonna be challenging in many ways. But what do we pick up again? What do we start doing again? You know, what do we put down? What do we choose to never pick up again? And I think this is a critical moment for us as Jesus followers. So the question I ask today is, do we have our eyes set on this kingdom? And as we move forward, are we again going to choose to reorient, reorder, reprioritize our lives towards Jesus's vision of the kingdom? James K.A. Smith says, it like this. To be human is to be animated and oriented by some vision of the good life, some picture of what we think is flourishing. So what this means is we all have some kind of vision of what it is to live a good and flourishing life. Something captures our imagination that reorients our lives towards some sort of vision of a good life. So my question is today is what is your vision that you are animated towards? You know, there's a true story from a couple of years ago of this guy who, um, is called Jay Misovich. I don't know if you've heard the story, um, but you can read about it online. It was in Harper's Magazine. And he began to claim that on the seafloor, there were thousands, millions of emeralds, half a billion dollars worth on the seabed floor. And it was from um, a Spanish shipwreck in 1622, he claimed. He was so convincing, he was able to convince clever businessmen actually to pour their money into helping him find these emeralds on the seabed. Well, it all turned out the whole thing was completely made up by Misovich. And, uh, you know, he even purchased emeralds from the market and he placed them on the seabed so he could keep the lie going and the money coming in. You see, there are a lot of pearls and visions of the good life, visions that promise a free and a flourishing life, a meaningful life. And many of them can lure us in. You see, I think our vision can be such a blender mix of the things that we have consumed 
and if we'd spent more time maybe reading the word and then watching the news or Netflix and social media, maybe we would have a clearer vision of what radical kingdom living really does look like and what we're called to. So a challenge for us this week, uh, for us all, could be to read the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew um, and from chapters five to seven and ask the Lord to reveal his vision to you and challenge you in the reordering and the reprioritizing of your life. You know, we can so often live life on autopilots and try and fit and shoehorn the God moments into our busy life but instead I believe there's a calling on each of us to recenter um, Jesus place him at the center and reorder our lives around him and his vision for the kingdom William O'Paulsall says this athletes musicians writers scientists and others progress in their fields because they are well disciplined people Unfortunately, there is a tendency to think that in matters of faith, we should pray, meditate and engage in other spiritual disciplines only when we feel like it. I wonder what disciplines and rhythms that uh, maybe we need to reintroduce or introduce as we come out of lockdown restrictions. You know, this idea of being transformed, it got me thinking about how some roses and plants grow you know certain plants they need trellis as a support structure to grow and blossom and in order for us to grow transform be kingdom people with this kingdom vision you know i would ask what support structures do you have around you at living hope we're passionate about gathering together connect groups um, about surrounding ourselves with christian friends and um you see, we can approach our walk with Jesus organically with no intentionality at all. And in those cases, we will never be the fittest athletes or the most talented musicians, like it said in that quote. Um, you know, that, those things don't happen with a lack of intent. So we need to stay focused on Jesus, move towards a kingdom vision. We need individual support structures in place, but also collective ones too. And I passionately believe that this journey isn't to be done alone. Let's practice community, you know, which is why at Living Hope, we do love to gather. And um, every week we love showing up in our gatherings, practicing breaking bread together, praying together. You know, there'll be some days, um, you know, where we don't feel like it. Let's be honest, you know, even I sometimes don't feel like it. But, you know, we show up and in the showing up, we're always glad that we did because we are tending to the presence of Christ in our lives, sharing our pain and sharing our joy together, celebrating together, working out our salvation with fear and trembling together. So I want to encourage you as you think about what it is to live radiantly. I encourage you to think about your diaries, think about your schedules as lockdown lifts. It seems to me that in this parable of Jesus, that when they saw and tasted the goodness of the kingdom, the disciples' lives were reordered and reoriented towards that vision. You know, I wanna pray, continuously and relentlessly pray in these coming few months, um, that as lockdown restrictions ease, that we would be a people who would be able to peel away any manufactured false visions that promise a flourishing life and instead behold a radiant God whose kingdom is future and present and that we would reorient our lives around that vision. Let's pray. Lord we give you thanks for what you have given to us to not sit back but to participate in all that you are doing in this world and may we be animated about your kingdom where you Jesus are at the center may we radiate your glory I pray Lord God on Russell's Hall on Milking Bank and actually right across Dudley in such a way that others take notice and may we taste and see how good you are Lord today and then may we reprioritize our lives around you, Lord Jesus. 
We pray, God, would you have your way in us today. May our hearts be soft towards you in order to receive all that you want to do in us today. And Lord, if we need to taste and see and remind ourselves of your kingdom, Lord God, I pray that right where we are right now, Lord God, that you would do that for us. Um, that, Father, you would, you, you would just presence yourself around us and remind us, Lord God, of your goodness, of your faithfulness and of this kingdom that we have experienced and that we can continue to experience here on this earth, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.